Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Build Your Copywriting Business Podcast. Hello, everyone on this call. <laughs> hey. Um, hello. 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 So as always, I am joined by my fabulous co-host, Kate Sitars. Hello, Kate. Hello, hello. Hello. And today, uh, which I think is a podcast first, we are joined by three guest stars, Kate Kosadar, Jen Breeze, and Dorothy Wisniewski. Hello, ladies. Hey, so glad to be back. Yay. Um, we're super excited today because we want to dig into a topic that we know that people have questions about. And I was just telling everyone that it's actually very appropriate to be talking about this topic because here I am recording from my parents' house while I visit them and also simultaneously uh, attend a business conference in the Milwaukee area. But we're talking about parenting. We're talking about building a business slash starting a new career while you have children in the house. I think for a lot of people who are thinking about taking that step, uh, it, it feels daunting, if not an insurmountable obstacle. And all three of you have been able to not just build your new career, get started in your new, your new career, uh, but be very successful with it. So we definitely want to hear from you, the highs, the lows, any advice you, you have to offer. Um, so let's maybe start by giving a little bit of background. Um, Kate, if you want to start talking about, you know, giving us high level look about getting into copywriting and also letting us know what, if you're comfortable, um, what your, your family is like, kids in the house, all of that kind of thing. Sure. So I started copywriting um, in uh, July of 2019. And um, I have, you know, it's been about three years, a little over three years of building my business. Um, and I have four children. Uh, the youngest is five and the oldest is 15. Um, we kind of have like two litters sort of like, so there's two that are close together and then a six year gap and then two that are close together. Um, and yeah, uh, the biggest challenge of course was that COVID hit uh, just as I was, moving full-time into my freelance business. Um, and so juggling um, no school and sometimes school and all that stuff while doing working at home was a really big deal. So, but we did it, so. Yeah, you survived, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's what we do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, Jen, can you give us some, some in, insight into your your business and your family yeah sure um so i have a seven-year-old son and a nine-year-old daughter and i am actually homeschooling mine so they are home like we are all in this house all day we we go to school here we work here we live here and eat here and um it's it's a lot but it's perfect like it's the most abundant feeling ever to be home with them. And my son got sick the other night and, and, you know, crawled into bed with the fever and the crying and, and I didn't have to worry about like, Oh no, I'm gonna have to get a sub tomorrow. I'm gonna have to call the boss and get, you know, like all the things that go through your mind when you have one of those jobs, like it, that didn't even cross my mind. I just got to snuggle them and like, well, we'll figure it out tomorrow. And, um, so it's such a blessing and, and, and it's, it's definitely doable. Yeah. Awesome. And Dorothy, what's your story? Yeah. So I started learning copywriting in 2019, in January of 2019, I joined CCA. Um, and I came to it because I was disabled by a chronic illness a, a few years before that. And I still am, but I was looking for a thing that I could still do. So I found the CCA and discovered that I really liked writing copy and started getting clients and building a business from there. Um, so for me, it's been great working as a freelancer because I can still prioritize my health and make decisions around that rather than having to follow somebody else's, you know, rules for what a real career looks like and maybe get sick, maybe be healthy. I don't know, you know, um, so that's, that's been great. And my, my kids, I have a 13 year old and an 18 year old. So that's who I have at home. Fantastic. Now. 
when you guys were thinking about getting into copywriting, thinking about a career change, what were your concerns, um, especially as relates to your families? I knew for, for sure that I wanted to find a way to make money working from home. Like I wanted to be a stay at home mom more than anything in the world. And, um, but we couldn't afford for me to just not have an income. So I tried, like, I tried different ways to make money. You know, I tried an MLM. I tried, um, I tried doing, um, teaching ESL for a company, you know, in, in China, teaching little kids. And that was really, um, very high expectations and very low pay. And so that didn't really work out. And I was just so grateful when I, when I found a way to use my love for writing to create a a really good income. I don't, I don't have like a dedicated office space. So like right now I am, I am plunked in the corner of my living room. Like I have a little desk area and this is my space, but it's not like a dedicated space, you know? So if, if, you know, sometimes people think like I could never work at home or house is too small or what, like people are doing this off their dining room table. Like it's, it, you don't have to have the the typical setup, you know, you can make it work. And sometimes my kids are playing Legos just a few feet away while I work and it's okay. Mm-hmm. It works out. For me, um, this is KK. Um, my previous job required that I travel all around the state. And so there were a lot of situations where, um, and my husband's job currently also requires a lot, a lot of travel around the state. Um, so it was very uh, odd schedules and it started becoming a concern. Who's going to pick up the kids from the bus? Like where, you know, um, who's, and they started to get older um, and doing extracurriculars and things like that. So that's what was exciting to me about uh, having like a work from home job. And just like Jen was sharing, um, I looked at all those things uh, and never actually did the ESL teaching or anything because I am not a teacher at heart. Like you are amazing person, Jen. Um, But, you know, some of the concerns that I had uh, were really around finances. Like there's there's something um, that feels secure about having a salary or even an hourly wage. Um, um, And so the transition to uh, my salary job, it was not high paying. I worked for a nonprofit. So it was, um, I make a lot more now. Um, Let's just say that. Um, (laughs) But the transition from that steady, regular, every two weeks, I got this set amount of money to, I have no, I, well, it's not that I don't have any idea, but uh, it's not a regular occurring paycheck that magically appears in, uh, in my bank account. Um, you know, so that was the biggest challenge. Um, and my husband, at the same time as I transitioned to, I think I've shared this on other during other conversations, but the same time I was transitioning to freelance copywriting, he transitioned out of his nonprofit salaried job into uh, a commission only sales job. So um, we both kind of went, okay, <laughs> hopefully this works out. And um it has, and it's been a lot of work and a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say it's been magical, but it has been transformative for sure. Being able to trust ourselves like that. Dorothy, did you have any concerns getting into it? As far as the kids went, I mean, I had some of the same concerns as, as Jen with having a workspace where, you know, when the kids are not in school, will I still be able to work? Um, It was a little bit easier for me than it probably was for KK because I didn't have, you know, kids under 10 at the time when COVID hit and everything was at home. Um, But I live in an old house. The way that it's laid out, the one room that was available for a desk that I could work at is not an office space. I literally don't have a door. There's a curtain. And I don't give office tours because like I also share this room with, you know, the coats and boots and some other stuff, but that doesn't stop clients from taking me seriously and paying me money. So like, don't let that stop you. 
Um, the other thing for me, I think, as far as the kids went is just, I knew they were watching how I handled my transition period. And they had seen me struggle with figuring out, okay, who am I now that I can't be the same reliable mom that just made things happen before, you know, I was in charge of so many things, you know, how women end up being the household manager, even in egalitarian relationships. Um, I had a lot of that stuff that I just couldn't do anymore. And so I knew that they were watching, how am I going to handle this difficult period? And what am I going to do next? How am I going to get up again? Right. So I was looking at a lot of things. I knew I needed to do something remote and part time, and I needed to have some flexibility in my schedule so that I could still take care of my health. Um, but I didn't want to do something minimum wage. You know, <laughs> I have a lot of life experience. I have a college degree. I've done a lot of things. I have transferable skills. So um, I, I knew they were watching to see what kind of next step I chose. And I wanted to make sure it wasn't something that made them feel when you're in a difficult position, you just have to take what you can find, mm -hmm. that you can actually make some choices to better your situation, even if you're in a situation like I was. So that was my biggest thing is, is making sure that I was, I was setting a good example for how to handle a really difficult situation. Mm -hmm. um, and also that I could still have a schedule where I could be there in the mornings and afternoons, you know, so I, I knew I wasn't going to be taking 7 a.m. meetings or 5 p.m. meetings because they needed me at mm -hmm. those times, you know, so the, the standard parents wanting to be present stuff that was all there for me. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I know Kate, Kate, you've talked about this similarly before of setting that example for your kids and showing them that you can do something else. That's, you know, building a business that that's possible. I'm curious for all of you, if, if your kids have noticed that and what their reactions have been to say, Oh, you know, my mom's a bad. Um, yeah, for me, I mean, my kids are older than I don't, I don't remember too. And I'm sorry how old your kids are, but I know my kids are older than Kate K's. And um, it's interesting because, I mean, my 13 year old, he's a 13 year old. So he's like, he's there and he's listening, but he's not always participating in the conversations. But he's definitely got one of those two, up. Dorothy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, he has a basic understanding of what, what I do. And, and so does my daughter. And it's actually funny because now, um, well, it's not a recent development actually pretty early on when i was learning about copy and the tactics that make it really effective or really ineffective um and then i started you know in that learning mode in the beginning you're constantly looking at every single piece of copy that you see which is all over and you're analyzing it and you're picking it apart and saying what you would do better um so i was i was doing that out loud and my kids started picking up and now they do that too so every time they see a piece of marketing or commercial or whatever it is they're picking it apart and talking about, you know, how it's not into, it's not written for the right audience, you know, and that kind of stuff. And it's, that makes me really proud. So I think um, it's been fun seeing them sort of take in what I do and get an understanding of it and how they talk to other people about what I do. It's just been fun because I think that I, they've never said, Hey mom, I'm proud of you but I think they are. Yeah, they definitely are, Dorothy. They must be. I mean, how could, <laughs> ahead, they, not? How could they not be, really? Seriously. <laughs> um, my kids, so they're seven and nine, and they think I'm, like, such a rock star. Like, they, you know, when I, when I make, a, a, you know, land a new client or make a new deal, you know, like, I'll go celebrate with them. Like, I just made it six thousand dollars sale and they're like six thousand yeah dollars? that's what? The like, it's so <laughs> much money what <laughs> they think it's so great and and um when we we just recently had a uh, vacation in the smokies and my daughter made a friend with some girl at the swimming pool and i heard her saying my mom's a writer she makes a lot of money you know <laughs> 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 i'll take it, it. <laughs> uh yeah i uh, what Dorothy was saying about the, <clears throat> the reading copy out loud, like I so many times I'm like, this is excellent copy. Do you see? And I'll just like 
you see how they did this? Like, look at this benefit. Like, isn't that super compelling? Let's just imagine you were this, the audience, you know, and uh, my teenagers are like very kind of eye rolly about it for sure. Um, but I have high hopes for my 13 year old, Jonah, if you're listening, definitely <laughs> uh, think Jonah would be a great copywriter, um, but he's at a contrary stage. So he, of course he's not doing that, um, but he has a way with words. So I remember the first dream client that I had, like, oh, I really want to work with this person. One day uh, I was like on her list and blah, blah, blah. And I just really liked the company. Um, and I finally got up the nerve, you know, two years in to, to pitch her and I landed the job. Like I, it was amazing. Um, and I was just like on cloud nine and I was running like, like probably literally running around the house of course this is during COVID so they're all there and, uh, <laughs> and I'm like guys I just like this is so exciting and it's like an organizing company so they don't care about like whatever I'm writing about necessarily but they um, are gracious enough to at least pretend to be excited with me and um, but it's fun to be able to share those wins and those moments with them but what I'm also careful to do, um, because I struggle personally with thinking everything should be easy. Like I want everything to be easy. And so doing hard things is, I mean, it's hard for everyone, but like I get real whiny sometimes about when I have to do hard things. Uh -huh. Like I'm just whiny. Um, and so I try to share with them also the things that are hard and to frame it in such a way like, you know, I overcame this um, fear or I overcame this uh, challenge or this obstacle. And, you know, whether I succeeded or not, at least I'm showing that I'm trying. And um, that's what I, I want them to see, like both those sides. And I think it's a real um, privilege to be able to, to show that from our house because they do like they see it. Uh, and, and, you know, no matter what your career is, whether you work outside the house or, or whatever, you do have those challenges and in those experiences to share with your kids. But the fact that I'm able to like be in the middle of all the action. And so they're like, they're getting that like real time, like, oh, I can't believe I got this email or, you know, whatever it is. Um, it's kind of cool being able to, and then like, can relate their teachers are like their clients. That's what I tell them. <laughs> like, so if they're like, I don't want to do homework or whatever. I'm like, but your client gave you a deadline. You have to <laughs> so um, when they complain about that stuff, I can be like, yeah, I hear you do it anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Well, and I think too, on both sides, right? There's so many opportunities to to parents have so many and are so good about celebrating their children and celebrating their wins. And it's so beautiful that your kids are able to, to whatever degree they're able to, they're still kids, to celebrate your wins. And what a beautiful sharing of, of, of emotion and, and celebration and just beautiful. Um, but I also love too, that, that it's so instructive to teach them yeah, stuff is going to be difficult. I'm going to do it anyway. You're going to do it anyway. And then we're going to celebrate on the other side. I think that's amazing. Um, we were talking yeah. a little bit earlier about, um, about, uh, about schedules and about office spaces, um, often made out of places that were not, uh, were never intended to be office spaces. And I think that that requires some, some boundaries of yes, when mom is in this space, I'm available. When mom is not in this space, I'm not available. How have you guys drawn those boundaries and have you had some challenges or, or any wins? What can you share? I guess I can go first. So I, I have my spaces bounded by a curtain rather than a door. So I can't do the standard, like the door is closed. Don't bother me thing. But if the curtain is closed, they're not supposed to, it's complicated by the fact that this is where the coats are. So it's not a hundred percent foolproof. I still have people sometimes like peek in the curtain and be like, I'm heading out. See you later. And I just ignore them because they can see my webcam and I'm on a meeting. Um, 
so it's not perfect, but, uh, you know, I, I tried to set expectations when I set up the space, be like, listen, here's what I need you guys. Uh, you know, let's just try to give each other the space that we need to do the things that we need to do. Um, and it's, there was a learning period, I think, but I think we've worked it out pretty well at this point. I'm good at ignoring people because I'm a mom. Uh, if I <laughs> if I just have to get things done, um, I'm good at tuning them out if they're just doing ridiculous things that don't actually need my attention. And then they're like, oh, okay, she's not responding. I'll go do something else. So, you know, they, they learn whatever rules you put into place and they'll, they'll, they're kind of like dogs. They'll push as far as you let them. So that's, yeah, that's, it's just trying to be clear from the beginning. How, how can we make this work for everybody in this shared space? So that nobody feels like they're getting trampled over or whatever um and then just being patient with each other and yourself as everybody's acclimating to those those expectations the for boundaries for me um it feels super easy now be uh compared to um the pandemic <laughs> uh because we were just all on top of each other um at the time, my youngest was in preschool three and trying to do online learning. And then I had a kindergartner trying to learn to read over the iPad with her teacher. And um, then the teenagers, of course, who could not, one of which could not stay on task to save his life. So we at times were like just all at the dining room table you know, so now that they're like reliably back in school, it is, uh, it feels like a breeze compared to that. I mean, I, I have had Zoom calls with clients where uh, my youngest has come screaming and crying into the room half naked, just like, anyway, it's, and I think we were trying to record a podcast one time and they would not stop fighting. Um, so, it, you know, these things happen and we're all human. So clients, typically understand, especially during COVID, I think everybody was really understanding. Um, but now that that's, uh, that phase is more or less over, the, the boundaries that I have to set are really with myself. Um, and I, it's definitely a work in progress. I try to have my work hours be their school hours because I want to be available to them um, not just, you know, with my attention, but also like emotionally available for whatever it is um, that they need after school. Um, but then I'm also like a taxi service and all that stuff, getting kids to work and sports and whatever. Um, so like I try to have my, my cutoff time be, it's ridiculous guys, two o'clock in the afternoon, that's when I have to be um, finished. Um, that's not ridiculous. Mine's two fifteen. There you go. See? Yeah. But like next to like a full-time job, it feels like luxurious, you know, like I don't actually have to work until five or six o'clock and then have a commute home. Um, but that boundary has the, that, that boundary is difficult for me because I really like my job. <laughs> I like to work and, um, I joke sometimes I should stop, I should stop joking in this way, but I joke that I'm a bad mom because like, I really like that they're growing up and they're getting more independent. And, and I'm like, yes, let's just keep doing that. And I'll do my client work. Please let me do my client work. Um, so uh, that's the boundary, you know, they, they're fine uh, in terms of when the door shut, honestly, they don't get a lot of TV time, the little ones. So like, I'm like, I had to schedule a meeting at four o'clock this afternoon. You get to watch whatever. So they're usually pretty happy to do that. Yeah. I am similar to Kate K with that, with the technology. Like I'm thinking that that's my biggest saving grace. So I, when I'm just writing for my clients, you know, I usually will um, put on headphones and just kind of tune them out. They're, they're milling around and, you know, playing Legos and um, watching oh, Disney or whatever. Um, and I just tune them out and write. Um, if I have a call though, they know they have to go back and either like watch TV in my bedroom or go downstairs and there's a, a PlayStation or whatever down there. Um, yeah, so I try to, I try to save 
um, tech, you know, screen time for when I have calls so that it's it's a treat and they they will happily just engage in that and let me have my quiet time um, on a Zoom call. And that seems to work out pretty well. And again, they're, they're seven and nine. Um, you know, occasionally, like my daughter, like sometimes my, even when my husband's home, like my daughter like slips me a, a sticky note that says, I'm hungry. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you have a father. <laughs> yeah, there's another parent in the house. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it's not perfect. And, and sometimes I just have to take my laptop and like go to, you know, the back corner of the house and, and hide if I really need to like nose down, you know, get this project done, I will remove myself um, and let them kind of have the rest of the house. But I don't know, we just, you just make it work. Like you just come up with rules and you, you know, I just make it work. It's not always perfect. But Does anybody else escape to a coffee shop sometimes just to like get out of the. I've gone to my mother in law's a few times. Ooh, that's, that's something. <laughs> I know a writer who used to go in the bathroom when her when her kids would just, they had, luckily they had more than one bathroom in their home, but yeah, would just go in there, close the door and be like, knock when there's an emergency, but otherwise leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bathroom is not sacred space in our house, so that doesn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> they come in there like Kramer from Seinfeld. Just exactly. yeah. What's going yeah. on in here? <laughs> boundaries, what boundaries? This is all of our personal space. We share everything. <laughs> <laughs> can I um can I interject to push back lovingly on something Kate K said the Uh-oh. bad mom comment because I was yes. going there so yeah you go there See, I said yes. it's a joke I shouldn't make anymore I'm trying I know, not. but yeah. you're still it's it's a use versus mention distinction yeah. and it's very fuzzy but I I think that makes you a good mom that they're getting more independent and that you're then able to take that time and do other things rather than literally spoon feeding them everything that they need that means you've done your job thank you your job is to raise them Mm -hmm. so that they don't need you anymore yeah so if they're already finding those steps that they can take on their own that's awesome you're all doing marvelously And You're wonderful. Thank you for that cheerleading. Yeah. And Absolutely. to add on to that, as a person who has found a career that you love and that lights you up and gets you so excited, considering there are probably actually very a, a small percentage of people who find that, I think it's admirable as well that you that you dive in and that, that you enjoy your career and you want to work. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to work, especially at something you love. And what a great example, because there's so many parents who go to work and they come and go, oh, another day at work. Oh, I don't want to go into work. Oh, can't wait for the weekend. What, what a much better example to have a parent who's like, oh, I love what I do. I can't, oh, this is so much fun. So that you raise kids who go, that's something that I can expect. I can expect, or, or at least I can look for, I will pursue something that I enjoy as much as my mom enjoys her career. I think that's amazing and a wonderful example. Yeah. That's something I actually wanted to talk about too. I, I literally wrote notes for myself so I wouldn't forget the thoughts that popped into my head while I was trying to sleep. Um, <laughs> it's that, you know, so many kids are raised in environments where all of the adults in their lives have jobs that they hate mm-hmm. and they're stuck and they can't see a way to move on to something that would be better for them and their families. And I'm not in any way judging those people or saying that it's their fault or anything like that. Uh, Circumstances are difficult, you know, and everybody is doing the best they can with what they have. But if a kid only has role models who feel hopeless and feel like they don't have agency over their own lives, it's going to be harder for those kids to grow up and feel fully autonomous and feel that they do have the skills and the practice to make their own choices and stand up for what's important to them because they haven't really seen a lot of that. Um, So for me, it comes down to, you know, what kind of life are you teaching your kids to live? Are you teaching them to live a life where they are and will always be a cog in somebody else's machine? Or are you teaching them that they can write their own story 
and that whatever hand they're dealt is just a writing prompt. Because you can teach them that by just showing them how you write your story, you know, by standing up for yourself, by setting and working to goals that you care about, by failing with dignity, by recovering from setbacks, right? Seeing you do all those things and modeling autonomy and resilience is going to show them that it's not only possible, that it's very doable because they've seen somebody they know. Oh, they've seen the behind the scenes. It's not like some historical figure from a history book, like George Washington, that you only see the really good stuff and it seems totally unattainable. No, they're seeing a real life person. They're seeing the struggle behind the scenes. They're seeing that stuff gets hard and you keep going. And then you can get to something better, right? By taking very intentional steps. So that for me is really important is, is you're not just helping yourself by taking that time to intentionally work on things that you love in your own career. You're making it possible for your kids to do the same thing in their lives. And then their kids and their kids, because it becomes generational. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Like you should fire. You should, yeah. You need to, you need to be at speak more speaking events, Dorothy. I feel like that's, <laughs> you are like, that might be okay. I'm adding skill. that title to my resume now. It's public Yes. speaker and speaker. expert yeah. yeah really though <laughs> yeah i'm curious though because the the bad the bad mom comment for me triggered this idea of mom guilt and i'm wondering yeah. if how that you've all felt that and how you work through that i have a lot of guilt from uh honestly before my copywriting career um my husband and i never made really uh, we just didn't have high paying jobs. We didn't have jobs that really paid us enough to um, fully support our family. And um, no judgment at all, just like Dorothy was saying, um, but we were in a common position where we were relying on some um, government subsidies. And, um, and I had to say no to my kids pretty regularly. Um, I shared in the, the CCA Facebook group um, a while ago about this time where money was so tight before copywriting that um, I, I was surprised by a $5 entrance, free, entrance fee to get into one of my kids' sporting events. And I was just sobbing, going through the ATM, trying to juggle, like, I had no idea where this $5 is coming from, plus like the ATM fee. And, you know, like those things were just so the hard, everything was hard. And, um, so taking the steps to, uh, kind of gain control and agency, I think that's what it is. It's really like that agency that I have now in my own business where, um, if my kids need me more than the bank account needs me, I can make that choice. Um, and if my kids are doing fine, I can go out and get more clients and I can fill up the bank account. There's also times where I spend money on my business, um, like, you know, um, training or like, you know, our mastermind, being a member of the mastermind. It's so important for my professional development, um, but that's money that I'm not able to pay myself. Like, um, it's, it's going to the business expenses. And so sometimes I look and I'm like, holy crow, like I've spent, you know, a lot of my revenue on um, business expenses and wasn't able to take home as much as I had hoped. Um, but then, you know, you just get another client. <laughs> um, so it's all, it all balances out, I think. Um, and then of course, like the time, there's only so many hours in the day and um, and sometimes I feel guilty about using the TV as a babysitter, uh, for the younger kids. Um, but for the most part, I've come to peace about that because I do use it intentionally, just like Jen was saying, like, it's a treat for them and their peers, you know, I'm giving them the gift of knowing what TV shows their peers that are watching. You're welcome children. So those are my major guilt things. Yeah, Jen or Dorothy? 
Anything come to I mind? Have, I definitely have had guilt, um, you know, around the amount of quality time I spend with my kids because obviously I'm physically present with them all day, but how like present am I with them? Um, <clears throat> that that bothers me at times. I, I feel like I'm not giving them enough of my like real one-on-one -on -one attention because I'll <clears throat> like Kate said I'll be like oh well they're watching Disney right now I could probably slip over to the computer and and uh you know dabble in this little project for a minute and then an hour or two later <laughs> they're like mom when are you getting off the computer so mom when are you gonna make dinner <laughs> oh it's seven o'clock that's weird <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so I do feel guilty sometimes um about about you know giving my family my my focus attention and also the you know reinvesting my money into my business um yeah but it, i think just everything takes time like we we have these Id idyllic pictures in our mind of what it should be and it's it's i don't think anybody's actually experiencing those things so um yeah, I mean, I, there's definitely there's times where like I'm ruining my kids. I should just send them back to public school and and, <laughs> um, but usually I have a support system that will talk me out of those moments where I feel like I'm I'm just messing it all up and, um, yeah, because my kids are really like sweet and happy and innocent and having a great life. Like they they got it they got it made, you know. I was a latchkey kid. I walked myself home from school yeah. and let myself in and watched Gilligan's Island until somebody showed up. Like, <laughs> so it'll, it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. it'll yeah. Be okay. We turned out better than fine. So <laughs> yes. Very true. Oh, goodness. Yeah. I, um, I feel differently about the mom guilt thing than I think a lot of moms do. Um, I'm not sure why, but I don't I don't feel guilty for working or for you know having my own ambitions or running a business that puts a little more pressure on me. And sometimes I'm more tired in the evening than I would like to be. Um, but it it shows up in in little ways where a situation developed in a way that wasn't ideal. So then you just find out how you're going to deal with that situation. So, um, for example, I've had a couple of weeks in a row where I had more meetings than usual. I was a little more carefree with my scheduling than I typically am. So that's my fault. Um, and I didn't want to just cancel everything on my calendar so that uh, I could go sleep for a week. Like that would have been great for my body, I'm sure. But I still have clients and I still have responsibilities. So uh, I've been more tired in the evening and my 18 year old has been wanting to rebuild our vegetable garden. I used to be a really uh, serious organic gardener um, and I had the, all these, these raised beds that I built and I, I put in all the amendments and I spent years developing these gardens. The last few years I haven't been strong enough to keep it up. So they've just been falling apart, literally, um, you know, it's just weeds. Um, and my daughter was telling me she's 18. And she's like, I've been feeling really nostalgic for having that vegetable garden and going out and just picking the snap peas first thing in the morning and checking for bugs in the squash flowers. And um, so she knows my situation. She's like, you shouldn't be doing any of the physical stuff. But will you help me if I rebuild the beds? And I'm like, Yeah. So we've been taking, you know, chipping away at it a little bit at a time because it's a lot of work for basically one person. Nobody else is that interested in rebuilding the garden. So it's pretty much her and I keep her company. You know, sometimes I can help out with the little stuff. Sometimes all I can handle is sitting and having a conversation with her. But that's really what she's looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of times we we make ourselves feel guilty for not showing up in the way we think we should. But really, we all are showing up in whatever way we can. And it's it's not some uh, ideal circumstance that the kids are looking for from their parents. They're not looking for, um, who's, who's the best, like June Cleaver. Nobody needs to be June Cleaver for their kids to be happy and fulfilled in their lives, right? 
They don't care about that stuff. They don't care how pretty your pies are. They don't care if you're always quaffed and always leave the house with lipstick on. They literally don't care. What they care is, are you showing up for them, mm -hmm. right? If they wanna hang out with you, are you able to do that? If they have questions and they want some guidance on something, can you show up for that conversation? Those are the things that they remember. They don't remember how many hours you work in a week or what your paycheck is at the end of that week. You know, it's that's not real for them. What's real is does this person care about me enough to you know, meet me halfway and and show that show that they care about me, not just say, "Oh, I love you." Are they demonstrating their love and it's just the little things everybody just wants to be seen and heard and understood and loved as they are if you're doing that for your kids you're doing your job even if you also have this other job that pays cash money <laughs> <laughs> yeah amen that's yeah. very well said yeah yeah Jen, I know you mentioned having a support system and I'm glad you mentioned it because I want to talk about what that looks like for all of you to have a support system. And I know it, it makes me think of outsourcing as well. And if any of you have started to outsource anything and I know guilt comes along with that as well to say, I need a hand with cleaning the house or getting the kids to school or whatever it is. So what are your support systems look like? And that's a great question. So uh, a lot of this I learned through the academy and through the mastermind, um, you know, because in the first year or two of my business, I got so driven, so focused on making this thing work that everything else fell apart. You know, like I'm not fell apart, but like my health, I wasn't working out. Um, I wasn't making time for friendships. I wasn't prioritizing things that normally I would have. So um, you guys have helped me learn how to, you know, block out my time. And so when I look at my calendar on a Sunday night, I put in the non-worky things first, you know, like my kids stuff, my massage, my nails, my, um, you know, just whatever. If there's a mom's night with my homeschool co-op, like that has to be a priority now because I will isolate myself and, and to my own detriment, you know? So prioritizing those things and blocking those in first and then fitting in work and zoom calls and stuff around that but just making sure that i'm taking care of all of me physically and emotionally spiritually um has been such a game changer and um you know i've also learned to start habit stacking so like i, I noticed that my friendships were kind of in the tank so um you know my when i close my laptop at five o'clock my the very next thing that I do is I text a friend like I can text a friend today right that doesn't take long and that nurtures relationships that I had kind of let fizzle out because I wasn't you know I wasn't pulling my weight I wasn't being a good friend I wasn't checking in on people they had to check out on me and so you know making those those tiny tweaks or like you know my husband is a great support system but you've got to work on those things too right, right? so like after we put the kids to bed we um when the weather's nice, we go and sit on the porch swing together and just have 10 minutes to just debrief on our day and, and like reconnect. And it's been so, so beautiful. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, making a conscious effort to keep my friendship strong, keep my marriage strong has been really, really important to my success in my career, really. You know, the more we'll have happy and well-rounded we are, the more we're able to show up as our best self and on the job too. And, um, and I have, you know, I outsource cleaning, you know, a couple of times a month. Um, I've dabbled with different um, meal delivery systems, you know, like a, your every plate or hello fresh and kind of things. Um, right now I'm using five dinners in a row. So like it, I pick out what I want to cook for dinner. It gives me the shopping list and I go to Kroger.com and order it. And then, you know, so it's, um, I think that's the most inexpensive way right now, but at least I've got meals planned. So when I also, when I close that laptop and everybody's like, I'm hungry, then I know like, okay, well, we're having meatball subs and I've got all the ingredients ready to go, you know? 
So that's those are some of the support systems that I have, but really just prioritizing, um, you know, the friendships and the opportunities like the, you know, the other homeschooling moms, I mean, um, I could easily just let that not be an important in my life, but it should be because that's, you heard me mention, like I have mom guilt around the homeschooling thing sometimes. And so I can, if I make the monthly mom's night a priority, um, it helps me to be a better teacher, better at work, all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you're seeing the, like getting that um, emotional support for yourself as well. Um, I'm going to take, I like that idea of the close the laptop, send a text. I think I'm going to steal that one from you because that's definitely also something I struggle with. For me, the support system um, looks a lot like the other parents that my kids play. Uh, my one kid in particular plays sports. Uh, play, he's playing soccer right now and he starts basketball soon. Um, and so I, uh, I've been accused by my son of over relying on um, some of the parents there to like help get him to and fro. Uh, but when I sat down and explained to him that I want to be able to say yes, um, like I was talking about always having to say no earlier, I want to be able to say yes. And with all the things that are going on in our family, in our life, in my business, like I would not be able to say yes unless I had help. And so uh, there's one uh, family in particular who's just such like so gracious and so willing and happy to help. There's no, she never makes me feel like I'm being a burden um, when I ask her to, to help. Um, and then there's another family that two other families that help get my 15 year old to work. She started working um, in the spring. And so getting her to the next town over so she can go to her job is like kind of like another thing. She gets her license next year, though. So it's exciting. Um, uh, the thing that I would love to outsource, I hate making dinner. It's like I don't like to cook uh, I don't know if it's because of um, that I have ADHD and um, one of the things that uh, the ways it shows up for me in particular is that I have a lot of trouble like figuring out what order things should go in. So even though like there's could be a recipe with the steps, like it feels really overwhelming to me, which is <laughs> so ridiculous to say out loud. But um, I really wish that I didn't have to make dinner. And so um, my husband and I spent a couple of weeks in August trying to find like an after school nanny type person who would come just like pick up the kids from school, help them get their homework done and get dinner started and just have that help for a couple of hours. We haven't um, actually found anyone yet as of this recording in October. Um, so there have been times that... Um, it's, I have, you know, been working on a, de up on a deadline or had a later meeting and literally six o'clock rolls around. The kids have been watching TV since they got home from school at three. And <laughs> I'm like, oh, cuss word. Like we, I, like, I know what I'm supposed to make for dinner because I am very committed to meal planning and trying to make it easier for myself. Um, but there's no time to make it. So sometimes the outsourcing just means, you know, a Chick-fil-A run or McDonald's or a pizza or, you know, and um, yeah. And I use my children, um, Jen mentioned the cleaning service. That's like, that would be awesome. I'd like to do that, but I have four children and two of them are like, definitely old enough so we've instituted a Saturday morning clean day and so I outsource a lot of the cleaning to them um they're in charge of cleaning the bathrooms and the litter boxes and da 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 da, da. um and it does, it's not perfect right like when your hired help is are 15 and 13 and seven and five like it's not going to be perfect so that's okay so there's like that balance of outsourcing and being okay with it not being maybe the ideal situation. I love that. I need to get better at that. 
that outsourcing things to the to the kids. We used to do that a lot. Each kid had their assigned things that they would do every single week and it worked great. And then the pandemic happened mm -hmm. and we were all so exhausted. So honestly, standards fell like pretty far. Like a rock. Uh, the bottom of the Yeah. Game. We just, you know, we used to pay attention to screen time. We used to all eat dinner at the table every night. There were all kinds of things we used to do. And then just so much, just, just so many hard things with the pandemic, with them struggling with not seeing their friends, with, you know, trying to figure out, you know, my son was in jujitsu classes at the time and they were all doing it on Zoom and that was really hard. And like, you know, just the weight of all of the changes and all of the decisions and all of the figuring out new puzzles you never thought you were going to have to figure out. Um, yeah, we let a lot of things slip. Um, and we haven't fully pulled back on some of those yet. So I should, I would, I would love to get better at having the kids do their chores more regularly again. Um, Sometimes my daughter, the 18 year old will offer to make dinner, which is fabulous. Um, she now works at a local restaurant. So she's picked up all kinds of skills and she's excited to share what she's learned. And I'm like, awesome, have at it. <laughs> um, I'm actually not the cook in our family. So I kind of hit the jackpot there. Uh, my husband had worked food service and managed a restaurant before we met. So when we started living together, he was just, the default meal person. I was like, absolutely, I'll let you cook the dinners. That's fine. I'm happy to have leftovers for lunch. That's cool. Um, <laughs> so um, that's something that I don't have to do. But with the pandemic and all of the compounding stressors that came about because of that, it, that got harder for him to keep up with the meals and everything. And, and I'm not just going to come in and tell him how to manage that. So we do end up ordering a lot of delivery. And so we, that's a service that we pay for. That's, that's one thing that we do outsource is we pay for the privilege and the convenience of not making dinner more often than we should. <laughs> it does add up, but um, you know, it's, you try to support each other as you can. And be patient with each other and compassionate with each other because we are all still trying to come back from all of the stresses of the pandemic mm -hmm. and it's affected people not just emotionally but physiologically mm -hmm. yeah. it's going to take a while for us to feel normal again i think and i don't think there's anything wrong with that it, it but it helps to be realistic um and kind <laughs> with yourself and with each other uh, because it's it's really easy to say well you know we're not we're not where we were before this isn't good enough we need to do xyz but if it's not realistic if it's not kind to where you actually are that's not going to help anybody it's only making things feel worse and making it harder to make real progress so um i, I think you know whatever support system you have cherish it and and treat it with care <laughs> um because we need each other. We're social animals. We're not, we're not built to do this alone. And, you know, whether you have kids or not, whether you have a business or not, it, you're doing hard things, you know, so we need each other. Yeah. That's so just beautiful. You do what you do, what you can show up how you can mm -hmm. and, um, you know, be there for each other. That's beautiful. Um, this has been fantastic. And I know that we have already taken up uh, an hour of your time. So much appreciate it. But if you had like just a very quick, you know, 15, 30 second piece of advice to give to someone who is either considering getting into a new career or, or just kind of starting it out, what, what would you, what would you, what would you tell them who was a parent? Stick with it through the hard beginning. Uh, my husband calls it the train. Uh, so a train takes a really long time to get up to speed. Um, and if you can, if, if you want to, to be a copywriter, you want to freelance, um, stick with it through that slow time and it will pick up speed and you will eventually be cruising right along and everything is going to, everything will work out if you work at it. Yeah, I agree. It just, it take it you know, in baby steps, little baby steps. You don't have to like quit your job and, and go full, you know, you can, you can dip 
your toe into like getting a client on the side and figuring out how you're going to manage the family life on the, it it's just trial and error I, I think everyone on this call we just we just fail forward you know if we if we either do something successfully or we learn from it those are the only two things that happen we learn and we just tweak and adjust and move on and um you know, so if things feel hard in the beginning, you're not doing it wrong. It's not a sign that you're not cut out for this. It, it's hard for all of us, and you just, um, just keep readjusting and and figuring out what works for your family. Totally, I love that fail forward. That's yeah. kind of what we have to do just all the time. That's how you keep making progress. You're mm -hmm. going to be constantly failing and messing things up. But which direction are you going to keep going when you're done with that? Right. Um, I think for me, if 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 you have kids and you're you're not sure you can take on like one more thing on your plate so a lot of times it's a question of i feel so overextended already how can i possibly put any more energy into another thing uh i think it's important to remember that the amount of energy that you have to show up for the things you've committed to is going to be different if you have things in your life that you love so a new thing might feel really big and it might feel like a big gamble with your energy but if it's going to be something that fills you up that feeds your soul that makes you feel amazing because holy crap, you have a career where you get to do fun things for strangers you met like on the internet who live thousands of miles away and they pay you good money for it like do it it's you don't know what what where all the chips are going to fall at the end of the day but you need something in your life that makes you feel amazing. So if it takes a little bit of energy to get that going up front, you know, that might be worth it. You know, if, if you're overextended and you feel like you're stuck with where you are right now, I think it's really worth considering whether putting the energy investment into learning a new career will pay off for you because you have to think about where you're gonna be, what you're gonna feel like, when you have that new career and whether having a few months or a couple of years getting things going and having hard things happening that you had to slog through um you know think about whether that's going to be worth it to get to that other side i love that thank you all again so so much um i know i i've gotten a lot out of this so i think hopefully both parents and and non-parents i hope listen to this because you all have so much great advice uh, to share with us. So thank you again for sharing your time, your energy. Um, and with that, we'll catch everyone in the next episode. Thanks for having me back. It's good thank to see you. everybody. Like what you heard? Hit subscribe so you never miss a video. And if you're ready to take the first step toward becoming a copywriter yourself, sign up for a free video training right here.